All right. Now, what I want to do today is, is continue because there's a lot of word I want to deposit in your life. A lot of word. Today's teaching is to deposit. I want to make a deposit in your life. Thank you, Lord Jesus. It just reminded me. You can do this while you're seated. Uh, but I want to do this before every service. This is something that the Spirit of the Lord said to me that I want this ministry to begin a confession. And every day of your life, you will hear about this confession. Amen? All right. Now, number one is going to be, I, you got, I want you to be, oh, I'm going to also have the people who are watching our television broadcast also to be a part of this. Now, we always do Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, but we're going to start doing this as a confession. I want this to be so until you start saying it every day of your life. We all, you want to put on the screen Philippians 4, 6, because this is something we're going to start doing in this church on, before every message. See, the more I confess the word, the more the word can come to pass in my life. Somebody say amen. Because your faith has to be in the word. Amen. All right. Now, Philippians 4, 6. Everybody know it by now, but we want to confess it. I'm putting it on the screen so the, in, the, in the NLT Bible, right? NLT Bible. Because they told you, don't worry about nothing. We're just going to wait. We're going to make sure it's the NLT Bible. We're going to make sure it's on the screen so that people can see it. Now, I want everybody in here to please do this. Not just now, every day. Now, when God tells us to do something, he knows something. And if he can get us to start doing something, something can start happening in our life by the Holy Spirit. All right, number one, worry about nothing. Come on, don't worry about nothing. We're going to use the word anything. Do we use the word anything? Okay, we use the word anything. Say, don't worry, don't worry about, anything. about anything. Now, I need everybody to open your mouth. If you have the spirit, you don't have the spirit, it doesn't matter. You keep your mouth closed. Don't worry about anything. Don't worry about anything. Pray, about everything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need. Tell God what you need. And, thank God and thank God for what he has done. What he has done. Now, let's do that. Let's thank God now for what he's done. All right, this is how we're going to start every service. So you need to practice on it because we're going to start doing it every day. I want to do it for you be seated, but I forgot. But I, I'm not going to have you to get up to do it again. I want you to make sure you do this every day. All right? Now, verse 7, which we don't have to do, but verse 7 said, then... See, once you do what you're supposed to do, then the peace of God who's passing all understanding guards your and keep your heart. All right? In Christ Jesus. All right. Because that's already done now. All right. Now, let's get into the word. Now, in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 14 through 18, we are doing a series on the temple of God. The temple of God. My message today is information. I want to give you so much information until... You, you will know where God is. Because it doesn't do any good if you don't know where God is. Don't do any good. So I want, I want to make sure you know where the Lord is. Because this is, part, this is your salvation. Israel knew what God was. And they, they focus of prayer had to be toward God. So that's why they Old Testament, when I get to another one of the teaching this series, it says faith toward God. They don't have that anymore. So you will know what it means when they had what? Faith toward God. That means they had to turn toward God and pray. It was called faith toward God. All right. Now, what I want to do today is I want to give you my subject. Let's go to Habakkuk 2.20. It came out. Uh, the other day, one of the messages, Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20. I want to go to that. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20. If you go to uh, Matthew and back up, I always like to say it that way, you can get to it quicker. 
You go to Malachi, Zechariah, them other guys with disease, Zephaniah, and them kind of guys. Haggai, you get back to Habakkuk. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse 20. This is going to be our subject. Say it with me. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. All right. And we're going to use the first line. Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 20. When you get this, say amen. I'm always waiting for it to be on the screen because if I don't see it on the screen. All right. Habakkuk 2 20. Are you there? Let's read it. But the Lord is in this holy temple. Now that's going to be your subject. It was a reason why it says, but the Lord. Anytime you see, but the Lord, it always emphasizes that something happened in the chapters before. But when it got down to verse 20, he gave you the answer. So verse 20 is your answer. So anything that comes up in your life, you're supposed to remember, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Will you say that with me? Come on, any, anything that happened in your life, you're supposed to say what? But the, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Now, it's a reason why he's there. I'm going to give you some of the reasons why he's there, but he is your salvation. Now, I gave you some words for salvation. I want you to help me out. I, I'm going to see how many we can name here. So, if God... For, has forgiven us, that means he is what to us? He is your righteousness. I'm just trying to see how well you are versed in the scripture. When you say the Bible says you are justified, God has forgiven us. He has justified us. What he has become to us. Now he's, be, you're right. These are words that mean your salvation. So Christ is my righteousness. That means my salvation. Well, how many know that he prays for us. He, he's our intercessor. He, he leads us. See, that's what the Holy Spirit do, right? He leads you. He guides you. He teaches you. See, all these things mean he's your salvation. So if anybody doing all of this stuff for you, at least you ought to know where he is. Now, if you got on an airplane and you was flying like my brother right here, and my brother, I won't call her name, he was going to China. He has a business trip in China. This already just passed, but he had a business trip. Now, he's up there in the, in the air somewhere. He doesn't see anything under him. Once you go into a place like that, you don't see nothing under you. Nothing over you. You're just in space, seem like. But how many know you have to know where the pilot is? If you don't know where nobody else, every now and then you want to look and make sure there's a pilot up there, right? Now, that's how I want to get your attention on, but the Lord is in his holy temple. Whatever you see going on around you, you don't see no cloud under you, don't see none over you, but the Lord. See, but the Lord is in his holy temple means somebody is leading me. Somebody's guiding me. Somebody's helping me. Somebody's teaching me. See, somebody is in control of my life. Everything that happened, my wife, uh, my, my brother and I, we just had a chance to go up and see my cousins up in Saginaw Friday. And my wife texts me and says, slow down. I won't tell you how fast I was going. But she said, slow down. She said, Are you just passed Flint coming back this way. I'm giving you some information. Now, if she can look on her phone and tell me where I am and how fast my car is going, why can she do that? When you think about it, God is in his holy temple. So God sees all, knows all, and is everywhere at the same time. While we was going, coming back, before we got back to Flint from Saginaw, we saw a lot of traffic begin to back up. As a matter of fact, we found out that it was, back, it was backed up from the other side of Flint all the way to Pontiac Mall. 
And then we saw, now something happened, but we don't know what it was. We saw a truck on the right side that had lost one of his big tires. I mean, big, one of them big trucks. Not semi, but way up in there. Lost one of those big tires. And he was propped up on a part of his truck. The other three tires were on the truck. So that tire went somewhere. Probably over there on the other side. And then we happened to see a little further, we saw another truck upside down. They was trying to get him out, I reckon cut him out. So something had happened very bad. Now this just happened before us. I don't think you understand. We just left coming that way. We could have been another two minutes, three minutes, four minutes ahead of that. And that could have been us. But the Lord is in his holy temple. He already know what's in your future. He's already know what's down in the front of you. He knows everything. But God did not let us leave from where we were until we was after, we were able to see. See, that's how good God is. And then I began to thank God because it could have been me. That's what you got to understand. But the Lord was watching out for you. All right, now, let's move on. So the word temple, we want to make sure, is God's dwelling place. Now, I know we keep saying this, but you got the church mind got to be renewed. Because what churches talk about is going to heaven. That's what we talk about. We don't know we're supposed to be experiencing heaven now but we don't know where heaven is now there is a physical heaven above you called the sun the moon the stars that is a heaven that's what heaven is made up of sun moon stars so you have a physical city that you can look up and see my god my god look at the stars Look at the sun, look at the moon, because that's what God called a physical heaven. But there's an eternal heaven, spiritually speaking, above that called the kingdom. That is in all of that physical that you see is also inside of that you can't see. And then there's a heaven in the earth, which is called Christ in the church. That's why we have our sun in our moon, in our light, in our stars. See, that's who Israel was. They were the sun, moon, and the stars. So you have to understand who we are now. We are the temple of God and the place where God lives in this earthly setting. So when I get to teach you, when I get to the book of Revelation, I'm going to show you I may show you today, but that the heaven that we have uh, for as eternal heaven that God has already created, there is no temple in it. John said, I saw no temple. So we have to know if he didn't see no temple, then we have to know what he meant. But I want to get your focus on who in you. See, we, we, we always say Christ in me, the hope of glory. He is. But every time we want, every time we want something, we look somewhere else. Somebody say amen. amen. All right. So Habakkuk chapter 2 said, but the Lord, one more time, but the Lord, but the Lord. is in his holy temple. Amen. All right. Now, that temple, I hope, is capitalized. They don't put it capitalized in the Bible. But that's what I want to go to. Now, I want to give you two quick things to show you. And that's 1 Corinthians 3. 16, 16, 17. We're going to do these briefly because I'm headed to my message. First Corinthians, some things, some things I have to repeat because I can't take for granted that you already know. Can't take for granted that every listener already know. At our 11 o'clock service, we like to call the names out of places that have been listened to our television broadcast. That's what we've been doing. We got people listening to us from Oklahoma, Michigan, Texas, Florida, New York, Arizona, Georgia, Nevada, Japan, Tennessee, Mississippi. We saw these people on, on our line contacting our ministry. We want to make sure there's some more that's going to call today. Please let us know where you're from so we can post it. We'll give you a shout out. 
Plus, we also talked about uh, our sister, uh, uh, brother, that was in the, I don't want to say nursing home because of the rehabilitation, right? Rehabilitation. Uh, what's your brother's name again? Alfonso. I got his name. I prayed for him this morning trying to think of his name. Alfonso. I want to say good morning to Alfonso because he watches us. A whole group of people watches us in the rehabilitation center. So we, we want to thank God for these people. Now, now you have to understand what I mean by that. You have to understand what I mean. They were watching another television broadcast. Am I right, sister? And they don't want to watch that one. They want to watch ours. So all of them get together and watch our television broadcast. Come on, give them a big hand. And we, we appreciate that. We know that's the Holy Spirit, right? All right, so we want to make sure we minister to those people. I want them to, I want them to understand whatever you're going through, Alfonso, but the Lord is in his holy temple. All right, now, God's temple, number one, is his dwelling place. It's where God lives. All right. It's set apart, of course, for the worship of God. It's his temple. All right. But that's who we are. Now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 3, and let's look at verse 16 and 17. Know ye not that you are the temple of God. Say, that's me. That's me. I'm the temple of God. The See, you, can only, you can't speak for nobody else. We only talk about folks who got the Holy Spirit. All right? You don't have the Holy Spirit, you can't say nothing. And if you got the Holy Spirit, shame on you for not talking up for the Lord. All right. 1 Corinthians 3, 16 said, Know ye not that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. Watch this. He lives in you. He lives in you. Now let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 6. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. The Spirit of God lives in me. See, this is, this is what really helped me most of the things that I do, what helps me is because I know what God is. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. All right, now, in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, I want to go to verse 16. Paul is going to say this again. 1 Corinthians chapter 6. And verse 16, he says, What, know ye not? It's like, oh, you don't know. Know ye not that he which is joined to an harlot is one body. I'm going to go down to verse 19. I'm sorry, I'm too high up. Oh, that's good, but I don't need that. Verse 17 said, but he that joined to the Lord is one spirit. See, you may one once you join to him. It's just like Mary. That's why I gave Ephesians 5, 32. Here he says, what? Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost? Now he's talking about your soul. See, your soul is God's body. Your flesh is your body. Hallelujah. Know ye not that your body, your soul, is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. You are bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your body and your spirit, which is God. So he's telling you your spirit, your soul, that word little s, it's your soul. All right. That's who you are. That's where God is. All right. Now, we're showing you this because this is very, very, very important. All right. Now. Let's go to that. But the Lord is in his holy temple. What I want to do is I want to take you through some scriptures to show you. Let me, let me show you what I mean. Look at 1 John 4. 1 John. Now, this is what he said to John. 1 John chapter 4. Now, this is what John said to his body. I'm going to show you that same thing in Galatia that Paul said to the Gentiles. And John, 1 John 4, 4. 1 John 4, 4. These things you should mark in your Bible. You are of God, little children, and have overcome them. Talking about the world, overcome the world. Because greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Say it with me. Greater is he that's in me than he that's in the world. So anything you're going through, see, this is why God gave us Romans chapter 8. See, that's why he gave that, gave that to us in chapter number 8. All those things cannot separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus. So here he says, John said to the church of God, Great is he that's in me, in you, than he that's in the world. 
That's a word you're supposed to always. Let me show you another one that Paul said in Philippians. In Philippians chapter number two, I'm going to give you a. He talked about a lot of them in Philippians. Philippians chapter number two. Let's do verse 13. Philippians 2, 13. Then I'm going to go to Philippians 4. That's why we did Philippians 4 earlier. Uh, Philippians chapter 2 and verse 13. For it is God. There it is. For it is God who is working in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. So God works in us. So we got to understand he's not just in us. He, that's where he works at. Now, everything that he does in us is according to his own word. It's God who worketh in you both the will and the do of his good pleasure. Look at Philippians chapter 4. How many know when Paul says, I can do all things? How many know what that is? Verse 13, right? See, you got Philippians 4, 13. See, he talked about supplying in verse 19, but first, look at verse 13 first. Philippians 4, 13, and then we're going to show you 19. See, these are things that you should have in your Bible. He's telling you what the God in you can do. Philippians 4, 13 says, I can do all things. Who's he talking to? Your soul, man, right? I can do all things through Christ. Where's Christ? Through Christ in me, I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. I can do all things, said I can do all things through Christ which strengthens me. All right, now let's go to, let's go to verse number 19. Philippians 4 and verse number 19. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Here's one verse. But my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Let's say it one more time. But my God shall supply all of my need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. So where's Christ Jesus at? So if, if, if God is in me, he, can, he, he supplies all of my need. And yet we don't have for the church don't know what God is. See, we, 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 have been, we have been lured to sleep with religion and tradition of men. The song has been religion, tradition of men. We made the song the Bible. Ain't the Bible, but that's what we did. Now, now let's go for a ride. Let's go to Isaiah 57, and we're going to look at verse 14 and 15. Are you ready for the word? Isaiah chapter 57. Isaiah chapter 57. And we want to look at two verses today. You want to mark in your Bible. And that's verse 14 and verse number 15. I'm not going to read verse 14 because I want to read it out the NLT. I'm going to read the King James verse 15 only. Let's go to verse 15 only. Isaiah 57 verse 15. Are you there? Watch what it says. For thus saith the Lord, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity. Where do God live? Eternity. Where do God live? Eternity. You need to put right beside there the word Christ. Because if he live in eternity, the only somebody that's eternity is Christ. Ain't that right? God lives in eternity. I told you last week, eternal life is Christ. That's why I told you last week. So you need to write that down. Eternal life is not I'm going to live a long time. That's not the definition for eternal life. Guess what? Everybody is. Whether you're saved or not. Whether you have the Holy Spirit or not. You're going to live a long time. You're going to live eternally. But there's eternal life and there's eternal death. So Christ is eternal life. How many understand what I'm saying? So once my soul is in Christ, my soul has what? Eternal life. So 
you don't ever leave God. God never leave you. Once your soul is saved, your soul is saved how long? Eternity, right? Eternity is how, it's forever, right? Some of you won't get involved, but I, but I just hope you, don't, I hope you don't wait until you get old as I am to try to find out something. Now you're getting ready to die. Now you want to find out where heaven is. See, you find out now. See, most people don't know the Bible and they get up too old to enjoy it. Right now, you feel like you don't need this. Well, death can happen to anybody. Remember, I've been pastoring 37 years, so I've had funerals from all ages. And it's not a happy, it's not a happy scene. I'm not pleased with none of it. Just a part of my work, amen? All right, now let's look at, look at Isaiah 57, 15. For thus said the Lord, the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. He says, I dwell in the high and holy place. How many know what the high and the holy place is? See, the choir should have jumped on this. You know why? Because you're the one sang the song. If you're looking for the Lord. He's in the holy place. And I ask you what a holy place is. You Look at somebody and say, are you in Christ? Are you the church? You are the holy place. See, that's why I'm teaching this right now. Like I said, most people go to church, they still don't know what, don't know what God is. And you can tell them God is in his holy temple. I gave you this subject, but the Lord is in his holy temple. I gave you 1 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 16 and 17, and said, you are the temple of the living God. And then come back and ask you where God is. See, if you was on the highway, you lost control of your car, you don't have time to think and look all around in the car to find out what God is. So you say, Jesus, help me. You better know where he is. How many know what I just said? You don't have time. When an airplane's going to fall and you're in it, you don't need to find out where God is. You got to know God right here. So when you say, Lord, help me, you got to know where he is right now. He ain't somewhere outside that plane. He's right in there with you. But we underestimate his power. We underestimate his ability. We don't think he can do what he did in the Old Testament. That's why people like the Old Testament better. They don't understand all the stuff that God did in the Old Testament for Israel was a type and a shadow of what he do in your life. That's why when Paul got the revelation, he, had, he said this in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9, put it on the screen. See, what, we've done, what we have done in the New Covenant, we have underestimated God. We saw him heal. Jesus came and he healed all the sick among us. We ain't seen that New Covenant. You don't understand. The greatest miracle, listen to me real good, the greatest miracle that can ever happen in this world is a person has received eternal life. You've been born of the spirit of a living God. You are a new creation. There's nothing greater than that. The greatest miracle that Jesus did was created a new creation. And he did it through his own death, burial, and resurrection. His disciples saw him and says, no man can do these miracles except God be with him. Jesus said to him, you shall see. I want somebody to find me this here. He said to his disciples, you shall see greater things than this. What, what if you shall see the Son of Man? I give you the verse. When the Son of Man go up from where he came down from before. You're going to see it. Them guys were out there watching Jesus and Jesus said, okay guys, I got to go. Well, Lord, where are you going? I'm going back to glory. And while they were standing there, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 9 through 11, I'll tell you, Jesus was taken up. Right in their eyesight. Now, that's the one we're looking for. 
We're looking for Jesus. And we don't really care about Christ because we can't see him. See, you didn't hear what I said. The church is looking for Jesus. They don't want Christ. They want to touch him and feel him and, and look, at, look at his beard and, and see the hair around. Hey, that's Jesus. They don't realize Jesus went back to heaven. He came and finished his work. Now he's Christ and we don't want him because we can't see him. That's why God gave you faith. Where you at? John 5, 20. Okay, let, let me, hold on to that. Let me finish verse 15 here. Come back here. Isaiah 57, 15. Let's finish that. Watch what the Bible says. For thus says the Lord, the lofty one that inhabits eternity, the high lofty one that inhabit, inhabit eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place. I asked the church, what is the holy place? I sat here last week, and I told you there was two rooms. And I said, on this side, you the holy place. Over here, you the holy of holies. Over here, you the church. Over here, you where God used to live, it's the holy of holies. He's not there anymore. Why? Because the veil of the temple has been torn in twain. So it's one big house now called the church, the holy place. I come the next week, I said, what is the holy place? You see why I got to keep teaching? I got to keep teaching until you realize that this Bible is talking to you and about you and for you. So everything God gave Israel, it was so you could get the revelation from it. And that's what God gave us. Here it is again. He said, I dwell in the high and holy place with him. Who is that with him? You can only speak for yourself. So I can say with me, but I can't say with you because I don't know where you are. God said he dwell in this holy house with me. But why? Because you have to be contrite and humble. He, he in me to revive the spirit of the humble. So why did God come inside of me? To revive my soul. Now I'm going to show you this in Romans chapter 8, verse number 11, when I get through. Romans 8, verse 11, I'm giving you the verse. He's here to revive the heart of the contrite ones. That's what he's in us for. So all the stuff that people have been going through, when Christ come in your life, he come in your life to revive you. To bring your soul back to life. How many know that's revival? See, when people say, oh, we have revival. Well, what is revival? What is the wife? When Christ comes into your life, he brings revival. Why? Because he brings your soul back to life. That's why the old covenant used to use the word revive us again. In most churches that have a revival, that's the song they sang. Revive us again, O oh Lord. Revive us again, O oh Lord. The church sang, revive us again, O oh Lord. Church don't know what revive means. When you've been revived, God brought you back to life. This, is, this happened at the cross. And it happened when Christ came in your heart. The fulfillment of it. All right, that's Isaiah. Now let's give me those scripts you have. Okay, uh, John, 1 and John chapter 1, verse 50. Let me do that one first. The Gospel of John, chapter 1, and verse number 50. Now this was Nathaniel when he called Nathaniel. He told Nathaniel, I saw you under the juniper tree. Nathaniel said in verse 49, Whereby you the son of God, you the king of Israel. Jesus said to him in verse 50, are you there? Here it is. Jesus answered and said to him, because I said this to you, because I said this to you and you believe that, you shall see greater things than this. Watch what he says. 
You, because I told you I saw you under the fig tree. You believe that? Thou shalt see greater things than these. See, once, once God's word is believed by you, he gives you more to believe. And once you can believe that, he gives you more to believe. He keeps doing more and more. He keeps doing more and more. The more you can believe, the more, that's how God works. God keeps showing you in your life his power and ability as you can believe it. Look at somebody said, take the limit off God. In verse 51, and he said to him, verily, verily, I say to you, hereafter, you shall see heaven open. Wait a minute. What's going to happen, Lord? You're going to see seven, heaven open and the angels of God ascending and descending upon the Son of God. How many know what that is? How many know what, where that happened in the Old Covenant and with who? Jacob, thank you, wife. Let's show them to him. That's Genesis chapter 28, verse 12. See, in school, you was growing up, you, you heard about Jacob Ladder, but you never stopped to read the story. Genesis 28. See, that's what religion is. We quote stuff, but we don't know anything about it. Genesis chapter 28. See, these things you should say. Look, I'm going to read this. This is when Jacob had a vision, right? Jacob ladder. And let's show you what God says. And let's start reading with verse 10. I was going to start there, why? But I'm just going to go all the way back to verse 10. Because Jacob was in church and didn't even know that God was there. Now, what's the difference in Jacob and you? You are the church. And still don't know where God is. The whole Bible always tell you from Exodus 25, verse 8, God said, build me a sanctuary that I may dwell with you. So why did God want his temple? So he can live with us. Why did he, why did he create Adam? So he can live in Adam. That's why when he came back, Adam says, Adam had ate of the tree of neither good and evil, and Adam had moved. The house had moved. Adam hid himself amongst the trees in the garden. And God said to Adam, where art thou? Why do you think he actually went? Because he was ready to rest. And the house had moved. Why do you think he entered into your heart? So you, you're going to find that out. That's why I had you to quote first. Don't worry about anything. Pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank you for all you need. Right. Why? Because God entered into your heart to rest. Where's the place of his rest? It's in me. So I'm not going to say it. You don't know where you're at. Isn't that something? He rests in my soul. Well, what is my soul ain't resting? Isaiah, uh, Genesis, Genesis 28. Here it is in verse 10. Jacob. Jacob went out of Beersheba. He went to Haran. He lighted up on a certain place. Otherwise, he went to sleep. He tarried there all night because the sun was set. And he took the stones of that place and put them for his pillows. He lay down in that place and went to sleep. And he dreamed, and behold, a ladder was set up on the earth. The top of that ladder reached to heaven. Remember that Jacob ladder? That's it. You should walk in your Bible. And behold, the angel of God ascended and descended up on it. What did Jesus just say in verse 50? You shall see the heaven open, and the angels ascended and descended up on who? You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. You missed it. See, that's why, that's why I did that. You, the angel is going to be ascending and descending upon who? We're going to give you a chance. It's in your Bible. It was in your Bible. I just said to you. The angel is ascending and descending upon the Son of Man, upon him. Well, where is he now? That's what you got to understand. And verse number 
13, that's where we are. It says, and behold, this is what he saw. The Lord stood above it. Ain't that right? And said, I am the Lord God of Abraham, your father. I am the God of Isaac. The land where if thou liest, to thee will I give it into your seed. And thy seed shall be of the dust of the earth. Thou shalt spread abroad to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south. And in thee and in thy seed shall the families of the earth be blessed. And behold, watch what he said to this man. I am with you. And I will keep you in all places, whether you go with. And I will bring you again to this land. I will not leave you until I have done that which I have spoken to thee of. And Jacob awake out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. Come on, put your hand on your chest. Say, Surely, Surely. the Lord is in this house. In this house. See, don't ever forget that. So when somebody's singing the song, if you're looking for the Lord, don't just be just, he's in the holy place, just like, oh, that's fine, but is he in there? All the moves ain't doing no good. He, but, but watch what he says. I am with you and I will keep you. So why is he with you? To keep you, whether you go, keep you wherever you go. And I'll bring you again to this land. I will not leave you until I have done all that which I have spoken to you. Now God will never leave you. And Jacob awoke out of his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place and watch this. And I knew it not. This is the house of God. I didn't even know it. And verse number 17, and he was afraid and said, how dreadful is this place. It is none other but the house of God. Somebody said the house of God. Yeah. Come on, say that's who I am. Yeah. Right, if, 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 if that's the house of God and that's where God lived, that's who I am. Ah, look at the next part. And this is the gate of heaven. Now don't forget that now. Said this is? This is. The gate of heaven. heaven. Said so the, the house of God is the gate of heaven. Gate of heaven. Mm, 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 mm. Hallelujah. Now, I'm not going to read no more of that, but I want to give it. Where was I at the first time? John chapter 1, verse 50. I read verse 50. Let's go back there. And then I'm going to read 50 and 51. John chapter 1. Are you enjoying the word? John chapter 1. See, when you realize where God is, it's going to change your life. See, I tell people all the time, all the stuff you allow in your life is because you don't know God. There's no way in the world you'd be doing what you're doing if you know what God is and was. 13, boy, you don't take a bad step, you're done. All right, let's move on. John chapter 1, verse 50 said, And Jesus answered and said to him, uh, Because I said this to thee, I saw you under the fig tree, you believe it thou? Thou shalt see greater things than these. And Jesus says, Verily, verily, I say to you, hereafter, thank you, hereafter you shall see heaven open, number one, and the angel of God ascending and descending upon the Son of Man. Upon the Son of Man. All right, now, John chapter 5, verse 20. All right, that's the next one. So back there where you got your notes at, John, you want to put down the John 5, 20. So otherwise, it, when I read the Old Covenant, he said it's going to be ascending and descending where? Up on the house of God. Now, I got to make sure you heard what I said. Let me go back again. When I read through John chapter 1, verse 50 and 51, he said, acid and descent. Go, go do that for verse 50, 50 again. John 1, 50. Acid and descent. Acid and descent. And where? Come on, I need it on the screen. John chapter 1, verse 50. How, how, many, how many know what he said? Is that the next verse? 51. Let's go to verse 51. John 1, 51. I want you, I want you to understand this. Where did he say... The angel is going to be acid and descent. All right, well, there, there's a scripture. You can read it now. What it says? Come on, now I need you to read it. Tell me. I need you to tell me. Just tell me what that says. Angel is going to acid and descend and where? Just one where? All right, son of man. All right. Now, I gave you 
the Old Testament. And it said Genesis chapter 28. Let's go back there one more time. Because he said he saw the angel asking and descending, but where were they at? All right. Now the Old Testament did not say son of man. I want you to see it, what he says. See, this is how you learn the Bible. Genesis chapter 28 and verse number 12. We're going to put it on the screen. The Bible says he lighted up on a certain place. Remember that? And the ladder was on the earth. The top of it reached to heaven. And behold, the angel of God ascended and descended upon what? Yeah, but, but it was the ladder. See, that, that's, that's why I want you to understand. That's why they called it Jacob's ladder. How was Jacob going to get from earth to heaven? When you go to Jesus, how are you going to get from earth to heaven? I am the way, the truth, the life. No man come to the Father but by me. That's what he's trying to let you know. He is the Jacob ladder. See, the angel was ascending and descending up on the ladder. But the new covenant told you who's the ladder. Oh, that's all. Let me move. It. Hallelujah. I thought you liked them nuggets. All right. Now, John chapter 5, verse 20. That's the last one, right? This is the last thing I'm doing because they're taking me too much time. I'm, I'm using up some time here. John chapter 5, verse 20. There's it on the screen. It says, For the Father loved the Son and showed him all things that he himself doeth. And he will show him greater works than these that you may marvel. That you may do what? Marvel. Then he's going to tell you in verse 21. As the Father raises the dead and quickens it. What does the word quicken it mean? Make alive, even the Son of Man quicken whom he will. So what did the Son do when he came inside of you? He made you alive. That's revival. That's what he was talking about in Isaiah 57, 15. He revived us. All right. Now let's go back and, sh and show you. That's what happened. Look at Romans chapter 8. Then I can get back on track here. Romans chapter 8. This is what God did when he came inside you. He revived your soul. Romans chapter 8. Thank you for your Holy Spirit, Father. Romans 8, 11. Just one verse. Then I got to go to work. We've got another eight minutes. But the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. If the Holy Spirit lives in you, he that raised up Christ from the dead shall also quicken. What the word quicken mean? He going to make alive. That's the same word as revive. Your mortal bodies. Now that's what happened to Israel. They were raised from the dead physically, naturally. That's why you see in the book of Revelation, they were still the 12 tribes of Israel when they were raised from the dead. That was Revelation chapter 7. When he raised them from the dead, he called their tribes. You're not raised from the dead. You're raised from the dead in Christ. All right. You were quickened. They were, they, he quickened their mortal body. How did he do it? By the spirit that dwells in you. So that same spirit made alive your soul. See, we, we, we got to understand, I can read you this out of the NLT and you will hear him tell you that was Israel. Do it sometime. Read Romans chapter 8 and you will see he's talking to Israel. He raised them from the dead physically. This is why people are waiting to be raised from the dead physically. You would not be raised from the dead physically. You can wait all you want to. If you do, you got to die again. But you are already risen with Christ. Let me say it this way. The Old Testament was natural things. The New Testament is spiritual things. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. See, that's what happens when you listen to too many folk. Special folk don't know. Because they, 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 they think it is natural. So they're only thinking about a natural resurrection. You, there's no natural resurrection for you. Now I know you can say what you want to say. You can go to another church. I can't help you. But you have a spiritual resurrection in a new covenant. That don't mean God can't raise the dead. He can raise the dead, but you got to die again. All right, let me show it to you. First Corinthians chapter 15. That's the chapter you want to study on the resurrection of Christ. 
All right, you want to go over to verse number uh, 42. Let's start there. This is how I get off track. So also the resurrection of the dead. It is sown in corruption, it's raised in incorruption. So you got to understand the Bible about Christ. The first thing we think he's talking about, that is not you. It is sown in dishonor, it's raised in, in glory. That's what happened with Christ Jesus. It is sown in weakness, it's raised in power. It didn't say it's going to be raised, it is raised. It is sown in natural body. Hello? It is sown in, it is sown in natural body. It is raised, I'm sorry. It is sown a natural body, it's raised a spiritual body. Come on, I say his sown a natural body is raised a spiritual body. There's a natural body and there's a spiritual body. You are not raised a natural body. See, that's why people think you're coming back to this earth. You are not coming back here. Like I told you, my wife, we pass by a cemetery all the way when we go home, and there are people out there laying on the ground by the grave. They got, last two weeks ago, they had a table, and they were having dinner with all the family. All that's fine. I mean, if you're comfortable and that's all that's fine, but they're not coming back. All right, look at verse number 45. Are you ready? Verse 45. Now, 44 told you it's sown, the word sown means planted. A natural body is raised a spiritual body. Now, that's not what people are telling you. People are telling you that the Lord come, he's going to raise you from the dead. We're going to take all the wicked and destroy it on the earth. He's going to take all us up to heaven. Then he's going to clean off the earth. Then he's going to bring us back down. And we're going to be, see, all that stuff is ha, ha, ha. Because the choice is lie, lie, lie. All right, verse 45. Here it is. It is sown as it is written. Verse 45, are you there? The first man, Adam, was made a living soul. The last, Adam, was made a quickening spirit. Verse number 46, how be it, that was not first which is spiritual, but that which is what? Natural. And afterward that which is spiritual. See, they already had a natural resurrection. That's why they were looking for Jesus. Jesus came in the natural realm to a natural people called Israel, and he was raised from the dead naturally. They was raised from the dead naturally. They're going to be with the Lord naturally. He had to change them over from a natural to a spiritual. That's why he talked about when the Lord come, you will meet the Lord in the air. You have to be changed from a natural to a spirit. That was them. But you already been changed. You told me you've been changed. All right, verse number 47. The first man, that's Adam, is of the earth earthly. The second man is the Lord from heaven. As is the earthly, such are they also that are earthly, and so is the heavenly, so are also that are heavenly. You are heavenly. You're not earthly no more. You sit together in heavenly place in Christ. And then verse number 49, as we have born one carrot, the image of the earthly, that's why physically you're just like your mother and your daddy. That's the image of the earthly. We shall also bear where? The image of the heavenly. See, you're not going to want this body no more. Why would you want it again? Now, this is why he said to them, for I say, brethren, Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God, neither does corruption inherit in corruption. But I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. This is what he said to Israel. But we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump. You ain't waiting for no trump to blow. You're not in Israel. They had the feast of tabernacle, which was the last trumpet. And they was raised, watch this, from the dead, incorruptible. And they were changed. That corruptible had to put on incorruption and the mortal had to put on immortality. So when this corruption had put on incorruption and this mortal had put on immortality, she'll be brought to pass saying, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where shall sting? O grave, where shall victory? The sting of death is sin, but strength of sin is the law. You didn't have no death, no law. The strength of death is sin, and the, I'm sorry, the sting of death is sin, the strength of sin is the law, but thanks be to God which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 
Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, unmovable, always abound in the work of the Lord, for you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. You're not saved by your labor. Look at Revelation chapter 7. I have to continue my message next service. Revelation chapter 7. But if I got to get off the course to get you on course, then I have to do that. Let me say it again. If I got to get off course to get you on course, then I just have to do that. Revelation chapter 7. See, Israel was raised from the dead naturally. I say Israel was raised from the dead naturally. You're not going to be raised from the dead naturally. As a matter of fact, if you are saved now, you are already risen with Christ. That's what Colossians starts off at, if you be risen with Christ. See, that's what happened when Christ raised from the dead. He raised us from the dead. But we, we don't want that resurrection. We want to see him in there. Because that's what we've been taught. All that stupid stuff about shoes. We got new shoes. You got on shoes. All right, Revelation chapter 7, verse 1. And after these things, I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow up on the earth. He's talking about the promised land, Israel. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. Having the seal? You already been sealed, you told me. And that's what the Bible told you in the book of Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter number Don't take it out of my mouth. First Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22, 23. You've been sealed already. You've been sealed. That's not talking about you. Watch this. And verse number 2 says, I saw another angel from the east having to seal the living God. That's what you read. I gave you that in Ezekiel, and I showed you that the ink horn. That's, the, that's the, what you want to have, the ink horn. And he... Chapter 9, chapter 10, when he took the ink horn and everybody that did not receive the mark of the ink horn, they were destroyed. And hear what God said. There cried this loud voice from heaven who was given to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not the earth, nor the sea, talking about Israel, nor the trees, till we have sealed the service of our God. You're not serving, you're a son. The service I got in their foreheads. I heard the number of them which were sealed, and there were sealed 144,000. You know that's not you. All the tribes of the children of Israel. Let me show you one verse we've done. One verse. 1 Corinthians. I'm sorry, 2 Corinthians chapter 1. The Bible says you were sealed. And verse number, I said 2 Corinthians 1, we're going to start reading with verse number uh, 20. Verse 20. Are you there? Watch what it says in verse 20. For all the promise of God in Christ is yes and in him, amen, unto the glory of God the Father by us. Now he which established us and which with you is Christ and hath anointed us. See, that's, what, that's why I don't use oil no more. I am anointed. Amen. How many know that's who Christ is? Yeah. Christ is the anointing. Right? And look what it says in verse 22. Who, who has also what? Come on now, I need you to do this. I showed you that, that when you're in Revelation, you don't have to be sealed. That was Israel. The Bible says he has what? Sealed. Come on, everybody. Sealed. He, he sealed us. So when you, when you do something you don't want it to ever, when you want it to last forever, you do what? You seal it. When you want to keep something, you what? When you want to protect something, you what? That's what God did for your soul. He sealed your soul with the Holy Spirit. That's why we gave the Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13 and 14. That goes with this verse. The Bible says he sealed us. And given us the honest of the spirit or the down payment of the spirit in our hearts. He sealed us. Ephesians chapter 1. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 13. In whom also you also trusted after you heard the word of, faith, word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Whom also after you believed, after you believed, after you believed, you were sealed. With the Holy Spirit of promise. It wasn't in the book of Revelation. You wouldn't seal no forehead. 
Come on, you weren't sealing your forehead. Don't be, see, if you're waiting for Christ to come, you have denied the one that's in you. Let me say it again. If you're waiting for Christ to come, you have denied the one that's in you and you ain't even saved. Listen, the Bible said, if Christ not be in you, you're none of his. My point is, you are not in faith if you're waiting for him to come. Because if you're waiting for Jesus to come, you're an old covenant. Jesus Christ did not come to the new covenant. Jesus Christ ministered to the old covenant. Romans 15, 8, we're going to close that verse. Jesus Christ did not minister to the new covenant. He ministered to those in the old covenant. He ministered to the circumcision, not to the Gentiles. Paul was the minister of the Gentiles. Romans chapter 15, verse 8 said, Now I say, we want to make sure it's on the screen. There it is. Now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision. Jesus Christ didn't preach to you. For the truth of God, he was, he was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made to the fathers. And that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. It's written, for this cause I will, count, I will con confess thee among the Gentiles and sing for thy name. And again, he said, rejoice, O Gentiles, with, it, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, you Gentile. Lord him, all you people. So you have to understand, Jesus Christ did not minister to you. Jesus Christ never said to you, I'm going to go away and come again. Never said to you. Why don't you receive Christ, which is the Spirit of the Lord. Christ is the Holy Spirit. He's the Spirit of the Lord. Jesus, the person Jesus was sent to the Jews. But the Holy Ghost, the Spirit of the Lord, is given to you. Don't reject what God has given you. Lusting for what Israel had and rejecting what God had given you. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, let's stand on our feet. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the Bible said, in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and verse number one, moreover brothers, I declare to you the gospel which I preached unto you which also you have received and where you stand, by which also you are saved. If you keep in memory what I preached unto you, unless you have believed in vain, for I delivered unto you first of all that which I also received, how Christ died for our sin. This is how the Gentile was saved. Christ died for our sins according to the scripture. And that he was buried and that he rose again the third day according to the scripture. You were saved by the blood of Christ. That's what the cross is for. Christ suffered, died, buried, raised again from the dead for your and my justification. Don't reject Christ. Hey, my time is up. I thank you for yours. And the door of faith is open unto you.